Hello everyone and welcome back to A Taste of Home Season 2. I'm Chef Bruce and I'll be cooking you a few dishes today that's going to be perfect for Valentine's Day. It's um, our favorite classic Filipino dishes. Uh, we're going to be making three dishes all with Yamamori soy sauce. Um, I'm going to start off today with the adobo pasta. So it's like a creamy adobo pasta. We're going to be using Lempo for this. Uh, so it's going to be pork belly, um, some nice pasta. So it's classic Filipino favorites, but done differently. So only one has rice, the other one has fries, and this one has noodles. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Ian, can you grab me the liempo, please? I'm gonna get my pan on. Come on. Thank you, bro. So we have here um, pork belly. We're gonna just go ahead and cut it up. Uh, can you work on the stove for me, bro? Now, the pork belly does have a bone inside. Uh, just cut it right where the soft bone is. And then just kind of cut that away by running your knife along the bone, just like that. But don't throw it away because you can still use this. But for this dish, we don't need it. So again, just feel it with your hands. Nice little soft bone there. And again, cut right through. All right. Now I'm gonna cut this into like one inch cubes or one inch cuts, just like that. That looks about right. And this will ensure that it cooks evenly. All right. Cool. So we're going to pop this in a bowl until it's ready for use. Have a bowl here. Make sure everything is nice and done. Okay, so I'm going to wipe up or wash my knife, wash my hands, I'm gonna cut everything else. Okay, so now we have the pork belly down. We have our uh, pan getting nice and hot. And what this is about is about building flavor. We wanna kind of get um, the, the belly nice and seared. So I have here just some regular onion. I'm using red right now. You can definitely use white. Uh, red is slightly more cheaper right now. I know guys, it's really, uh, the cost of vegetables are really high right now. Just hopefully it'll go down soon. So use whatever fits your budget. All right, so I just remove the outer layer. my board okay so I'm, ma I'm making sure that my pan gets nice and hot because I want that really nice sear when everything gets into it now I'm slicing my onions you can definitely dice it if you want to uh, but for me it doesn't really matter because I am going to strain the sauce Okay, so I'm here using Sunny Farms cooking oil. I'm gonna get that into the pan. Give that a nice swirl. I'm also gonna be adding my onions into this pan. So I like it when the food talks to me. I know it's, it's hot enough. So we're just gonna get it started. I'm gonna add some garlic to this. Just give it a quick smash. And when you smash, you can always use the fat part of your blade. Hold the edge side away from your hand where you're gonna hit down. That way you don't cut yourself. That's good for me. That goes in the pan. 
We give that a quick saute. Perfect. Okay, so what I also like to do to this is I like adding my sugar to the pan now. Now a lot of people say adobo doesn't have sugar. Yes, you don't need to, but for me, I kind of like that caramelization it gives. So I will add it. And I'm just waiting for the sugar to kind of melt and become like a, a caramel, if you would. So just let the pan do the work, let the heat kind of come out. We're going to increase the heat. So pretty much I have onions and garlic in here. I put the sugar in the pan. It's going to heat up and as you can see, it's starting to caramel up. Caramel. Yeah, it's going to turn into caramel. Tongue twister. And once that gets nice and brown, I'm going to go ahead and add my pork to this. And then it's going to have this really nice color to the pork. Um, some people use like dark soy sauce. Uh, but for me, I don't need to because I like the flavor of the Yamamori and it has a nice caramel color on its own. But I'm going to enhance it with that kind of caramelization going on right there. Okay, so I'm going to give this a quick toss. So as, you, as you can see, the color in the pan changed already. Now we're going to add in the liempo or the pork belly. And then kind of press it down till all the meat is exposed to the hot pan. Thanks, Ian. And what you want to do is kind of let it sit there for about like 10 seconds. Kind of swirl it around. And then when you start to see the kind of cooked meat starting to happen, it's turning white, then we can go ahead and toss it. All right. So as you can see, there are parts where it already took on the color. So you have that nice quick caramelization going. That's what we're looking for. So you want to kind of listen to it when it's kind of like that loud kind of you know there's a lot of water in it. When it starts to get more crisp and like more um, even in sound, you know that the water is being evaporated and it's getting a really nice sear. What I also like to do is I like to add a little bit of salt to this. This will also help extract some of the moisture in the meat so that you get a nice good sear like that. But you have to be very careful with the amount of salt that you put in because you're going to be adding soy sauce to this. And the soy sauce I'll be using now is the extra. So uh, I like the extra Yamamori extra soy sauce just because it has that kind of sweeter note to it. There you go. So that's what I'm looking for right there. Kind of that dark brownish kind of color to it. That's perfect. As you can see, I'm browning it. I'm not burning it. Okay, so the next step is we're going to add vinegar to this. Um, the vinegar here, we have to cook it out before we add in the soy sauce. Just because we don't want it to be kind of raw. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting for it to get nice and hot. And when it gets hot, I'm going to deglaze the pan with the vinegar. All right. So when you add in your vinegar, you want that violent reaction that it gives where it's like extremely bubbling hot. And as you can see, the, the vinegar is already brown. That's because of all the, like the brown bits of meat, the caramel in there and the uh, onions and garlic. Now, the best way to check if your vinegar is done is not really tasting it. You just have to smell it. If you choke and cough, 
then you know that the vinegar is not cooked out enough. So just let it kind of do its thing. Try not to stir it. I know it's an old wives tale, but I always do it. My grandma told me don't stir it until it doesn't stink anymore. So now I'll be using the uh, Yamamori Extra. I'm just gonna wait for it to kind of cook out. A little bit more. Now the vinegar I use is distilled white. Um, if you wanted to kind of enhance this, you can use like um, different types of vinegar. You can use uh, Sukang Iloko if you wanted to. You can use your own homemade vinegar, banana vinegar, santol vinegar. All right, so now I can smell it and it doesn't, doesn't kind of make me want to sneeze. And as you can see, when we toss it, look how brown and beautiful that is. And I, we haven't even done anything to it yet. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and kick this up. We're going to add in the soy sauce. I'm gonna add in my bay leaf and my peppercorn. Oh man, if you guys can smell this, this smells really good. All right, so what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna cover this up with just about enough liquid to cover halfway up the pan. And right now I'll be using chicken stock. Now, like with all things, you want to go low and slow. So I'm going to bring this back to a boil. When this comes to a boil, I'm going to pop a lid on it, turn it down to a simmer, and I'm going to simmer it for about 45 minutes. So we just wait, kind of chill a little bit, get the uh, pork and the liquid nice and hot. And always taste as you go. Um, you have to season every step of the way. So I am going to give it a quick taste. Now for me, that's just under seasoned. It's not so salty, but I know that this is gonna reduce down, so I'm not gonna touch it. I'm gonna let it kind of reduce. I'll taste it again um, right before I play with the sauce so I know if it's right or not. Okay, so it's coming to kind of like a rolling boil. Turn your flame down to a simmer, pop a lid on it, and then let it get happy. We're gonna do that for about 45 minutes. But to kind of speed things up, I actually have one that's already done. So I'm gonna go ahead and simmer this off cam so we can actually eat this for lunch. And then I'm gonna actually finish it off with the complete one. So while I'm waiting for Ian to change up everything, I'm gonna add my pasta to my boiling water I do have um, salt in this, so whenever you do have pasta, make sure it's as salty as the sea. And then let it fall down. Make sure that you get all the noodles into the pot. Thank you, brother. I need that pan, yeah, bro? So whenever cooking pasta, you have to always remember that the pasta waits for nothing. Okay, so the pasta is not gonna wait. The sauce can wait, but the pasta can't. So you always make, your, make sure that your sauce is done before your pasta, or it's gonna get done at the same time as your pasta. It's easy for us to do it if it's like pre-made things like a spaghetti bolognese, um, like this adobo pasta. But if you're gonna do like linguine and clams, that's kind of difficult. You have to make sure that your clams are done just as, as your pasta is done. Because if not, if one overcooks, it's not gonna be good. If the pasta overcooks, it's not gonna be good. So timing is everything. So just make sure that all your pasta is into the water and just follow the cooking instructions of the pasta. So this is gonna be about seven minutes. You can set a timer if you want to, or you can just always check it. But for me, um, it's critical that you follow the, the instructions on the package because they know it and they know what al dente is and they know when it's fully cooked. So each kind of pasta has a different cooking time because of the, uh, the wheat flour that they use or the semolina flour that they use. So just follow the instructions. Now, to kick up the sauce, I have here my adobo ready. I'm just gonna get my pan from Ian. 
Um, I'm gonna be adding um, the Arlo Whip and Cook to this to kind of give it that kind of creamy note to it. So we want it to be nice and jiggly like that. When the fat is jiggly, you know that it's cooked, okay? And it's gonna be almost like mouth-watering sticky in your mouth, which is just great. So what I normally do is I just add the liquid into the pan. Just like so. My pasta I'm gonna keep to the side. Or sorry, my, my meat. Give this a quick taste. All right, so what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that this sauce is full flavored. I want the, this to almost be too salty. And the reason for it is we're gonna be adding cream to it. Once we add cream to this, it, it'll kind of bland out a little bit. So this needs a little bit more salt. And a little bit of black pepper. Now, if you're one of those guys who don't like it, um, black flex in their pasta, you can always use white pepper, but take into consideration that the black or the white pepper has a different aroma and flavor. So some people may not like it. So just kind of ask your clients what they like. All right. So I know that's pretty much where I want it to be. I'm gonna bring this up to a boil and I'm gonna add in my Arlo Whip and Cook. That's about right. Okay, it needs a little bit more cream. That's perfect. So I thought about this dish because I wanted it to be kind of like a special event for you guys if you wanted to make this at home for your parents, your mom, your family, or your girlfriend, or your wife. It's totally up to you. We wanted to make it different because everyone loves adobo, but everyone's like, okay, how much times or how many ways can we eat adobo? This is a different way of doing it. It's extremely simple and it's pretty, um, pretty good too. I actually like it. So I know just by looking at it that the sauce is done. So I'm gonna shut that off, give it a quick taste. That's where I want it to be. Now I'm gonna, I made sure that my noodles have been, um, the water has been seasoned. So I know that once I add my pasta to this, this flavor won't get dull. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to set it to the side. And just because it's like Valentine's Day-ish, we're gonna add some, uh, some tomatoes to it. Some just really quick sauteed tomatoes. Now for this, I like adding a bit of butter to it. Um, that kind of gives a kind of more richer flavor profile. So I'll be using the Arla unsalted butter. Now, since it's unsalted, we are gonna salt it with a, just a little bit of salt. And what, I'm, what I wanted to do is kind of get frothy. Once the butter gets frothy, um, you know it's gonna like kind of get nice and good. And we're gonna kind of cook out the, the milk in it, the milk solids, and it turns into almost like a brown butter. But you wanna do it slow, okay? Don't just crank it up to high heat and let it go because what happens is you burn the butter instead of turning it into uh, brown butter or um, bernoisette as they call it. Ian, can you check the noodles? So we're just letting it go. Uh, we're just keeping an eye on it. 
um, just visually look at it and you can smell it. Once it starts to smell a bit nutty, then you're good. We're almost there. I have some nice little cherry tomatoes. All right, so when you kind of smell that, the buttery kind of turning into nutty and the color changes, then you're good, just like that. So I'm just kind of flash cooking it really quickly, warming it through so it's not cold on the plate. And I'm adding that kind of nutty flavor profile to it. And once the skin starts to blister, then it's nice. It's okay. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do you toss in a pan? Um, it's really easy. Just think about it as like a wave. You're pushing the wave forward and back. So you, you can pretty much toss anything when you think of it that way. And if you really want to try it at home, use rice, like a uh, big us. And then cold pan, uh, big us. If you can get it to stay in the pan without jumping everywhere, then you're going to be a good tosser. Okay, so that's what I want. That looks good to me. So I'm going to go ahead and set that aside. So we want the blistering of uh, the tomatoes. How's that look? Uh, four minutes. Four minutes, five. okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get everything ready and cleaned up so that I can go ahead and plate everything up. Okay, cleanliness is next to godliness, so make sure that you're Workstation is always clean. All your utensils are clean. Um, when I look for cooks and look at cooks when they cook for me, if they have a dirty workstation, I don't hire them. Because if they're dirty themselves, they're gonna be dirty with the food. So make sure that you always keep your station clean um, because chefs always look at that. All right. So I have here my plates. This is from my pasta? No, my pasta plate's here. All right. We're gonna keep this pasta rustic looking. Okay, so I have my pork here. It's nice and jiggly uh, because I know it's gonna be really good. You can always um, fry it up if you wanted to, but for me, it kind of takes away from the flavor. It doesn't have that nice kind of porky taste. It gets nice and fried or crunchy. So it's always up to you to kind of play with however you like it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my pan on. Get my heat just about right. All right. Ian is gonna drop the pasta in. So we want to heat that sauce back up. I'm going to get my pasta. Thank you. And we're going to drop it straight into the pan. Now I do want some of that pasta water. That's okay. Because we want it to kind of thin out and absorb into the sauce. Now it is kind of al dente which is perfect because we want it to kind of absorb the sauce that's kind of loose. So when you look at it and you see that the pasta is starting to get thicker and the sauce is going to get drier, then you know you're there. Now pasta should smile at you, okay? So if it kind of breaks and gets like that, then it's overcooked. 
But if it kind of has that like, kind of smiley face to it, then you know that you've cooked it correctly. That's really good, actually. All right. So you see how it kind of kind of, right? you see how it kind of got absorbed into the pasta? It looks nice and creamy and thick. That's what we want. All right. So we're gonna go ahead and plate up now. Now, we're gonna keep this rustic. So the best way to plate is just plate it in the center and twist. So you get height. And then for the last little bit of it, what we normally do is turn the plate. So it has some nice height to it. Now we have a nice big plate of pasta. We're gonna go ahead and top this with um, our double meat. And there's really no wrong or right way to plate this. Just wherever it falls, it falls. Don't stress yourself about it. Uh, but just put enough on there for maybe two to three people. I mean, if you're gonna feed like two people, that's more than enough. If that's for me, that's just, just enough for me. So uh, just know who's eating, so you know how you're gonna plate it and how much you're gonna put on. Okay. We're gonna add on the lovely little pieces of sauteed up tomatoes. Perfect. Then Ian's gonna grab me some leeks. And you notice how we always have a little left over in the pan um, of everything? We call that for the boys. So we get to eat it and taste it afterwards to make sure that everything's okay. Um, and we always leave a little bit of extra just in case something happens to the plate itself that we need to add more to it. So we always have a little bit of backup. We don't have to kind of start from fresh. We're just gonna go ahead and give this a really quick chop. Um, any which way is fine, but I like cutting on the bias so it's slightly longer. If you want to just kind of chop it up into rings, it's totally up to you. And remember everyone, cooking is about what you like and how you like it. So there's really no wrong or right way of doing it. Just however your family or however you like to eat it is good. All right. So here we have it, the um, a double pasta. Made with Yamamori soy sauce and Arlo Whip and Cook. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean this up and we're gonna start to make our beefsteak poutine. This is going to be awesome. So uh, stay tuned, stick around. All right, so we're going to go ahead and start my next dish. We got everything nice and clean. So I have here some oil that I'm going to turn on now. This is for my French fries. Um, I have my pan here. I'm going to get it really nice and warm. Um, and then we have beef. So what I'm using is um, beef sirloin, okay? You can pretty much use whatever you like for this, um, but I prefer the uh, flavor profile of the sirloin. So um, we're gonna go ahead and start off by making the marination. Now the cool thing with this dish is you can always plan ahead and um, you can marinate it the night before, before you wanna use it and the cooking time is extremely quick. So you're looking at about maybe 30 minutes max. Okay, so I have here some garlic that is just gonna be smashed.
The reason for it is I really don't need it to be chopped because we're gonna kind of pick it out a little bit, but if it's there, it's okay. And I'm gonna run my knife through it really quickly like five times, just like that. Um, to this, I'll just put this in a bowl. Okay. Again, clean my work area. Inside my bowl now, I'm gonna add black pepper. This is just regular cracked black pepper. I'm gonna add some lemon juice or calamansi juice, whatever you have. And then we're gonna be using um, Yamamori extra soy sauce for this. All right. Thank you, brother. So the trick here is the marination has um, acid in it. So the acid is gonna break down the beef. So all you have to do is just pop the beef in to the marination. Just like so. And you wanna give it a quick massage. And you wanna kind of feel it that when it touches the acid, you can feel that it gets a little bit firmer and that's all right. And the color will change. It, it's almost like what happens with Kilowin and with a fish, you slightly cook it. Okay, so we have our beef here. It's gonna marinate for about three hours but we don't have time for the three hours, so Ian is gonna give me one that I already made ahead of time. Thanks, Ian. So I'm lucky enough, I can vacuum seal my meat. Um, I do do it. You can vacuum seal it and keep it in the freezer if you wanted to uh, for up to a month if you wanted to. But for us, I just vacuum sealed it earlier today. It's been sitting here for about three hours. Um, and I know that this is ready for the cooking process. So I'm gonna go ahead, get my pan on, and I'm gonna cut the rest of my aromatics or the things that I'll be adding to this. So I'll set that down. Okay, I have here some garlic. I have an onion. Put everything up in front. Okay. So as you can see, what we did is we used a lot of the ingredients that you're gonna be using throughout the entire day, or for me, so that when you actually buy things um, in the market, you don't have to buy a lot of different things. It's, it's pretty much interchangeable. And what we like is, we're using the Yamamori soy sauce to kind of give it that consistency flavor that you're looking for. Now, you'll see that I'm making three different dishes using one soy sauce and pretty much the same ingredients. And it's gonna be extremely different, but the flavor profile is gonna be awesome. Now, I remember this one chef of mine told me that any cook can buy ingredients at the store and make it taste good, which is true. But the true artist takes what he has to make it extremely good. So meaning, don't always buy things that are extremely expensive to make things that taste good. Just use what you have and maximize what you can do with it. That way, one, you save money, and two, um, you get to learn different things of how to use the actual ingredient. All right. So we're just gonna peel that down. And if you notice the way I normally get all my mise en place ready is I peel everything in one go before I actually start cutting and cutting, yeah. Because I think that you wanna get everything done because the wrapper, the skins make a mess on your board. 
So you don't wanna have it like cut and clean and cut and clean. You just peel everything, get everything ready, wipe your board down once, and then go ahead with the cutting process. That way your area stays nice and clean. All right. And this little bucket that I use for when I wipe things down is what I call my compost pot. So uh, we turn this into compost. My dad's a really big garden guy. So he adds worms to it or he added to his worm compost and they eat it. But he doesn't like so much the onions and the garlic, but like everything else, the fruit, it's pretty okay. All right. Okay, so we have, now we're just gonna go ahead and slice everything up. I'm going again with a nice slice. Cause I know the onion's gonna melt down. I have here some garlic that's just gonna be roughly chopped. Just like this. And a pro tip is whenever you cut garlic, wash your knife afterwards. The main reason for it is you want to kind of get that stickiness from the garlic off your knife because once it dries, it's really hard to clean. And two, you don't want any cross contamination of flavor <clears throat> of whatever you cut tasting like garlic. All right. So everything is good. We're going to get, we're going to get our pan on. Okay. So our pan is nice and hot or not nice and hot, just turned on. We're going to add some oil to this. And again, I'm using the Sunny Farms cooking oil. And I'm gonna add my, my garlic and my onions now. Now, for this one, I don't want that violent reaction because what we're doing is we're sweating, not sauteing. So we're gonna sweat down the onions and the garlic. <clears throat> Excuse me. and not saute it. And again to this, I like to add just a pinch of salt. This will help extract the moisture and kind of get it cooking faster. I'll turn down my heat just a little bit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to sweat this down for about two minutes. We're going to go ahead and add in the beef and then we're just going to saute that up really quickly. And all we really want to do is make sure that the garlic is cooked out. So we have here our, my beef that I cooked or marinated ahead of time. All right, Ooh, compost bin. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna go ahead and add it to this pan. I'm gonna crank up the heat, add my beef. And we kind of saute that up. Now remember guys, this pan is hot. The beef is really, really wet. So what happens is it's going to splatter. Um, just kind of be aware of that, that it will splatter. Um, so just kind of let it, let it do its thing. When it kind of dries up, you're not going to hear that loud, like kind of sound to it. And it's not going to splatter as much. Now, since we are using a sirloin, it, it will take some time to cook. I mean, if you want to use like a really nice tender beef, like a filet 
or a ribeye or flank steak even, you, you can flash cook this really, really quickly. But since it's kind of expensive and we're trying to keep it within budget, we're using sirloin, it just means that we have to cook it down a little bit longer. So if you have the time, it's totally okay. I'm gonna cook this for about 30 minutes so it gets nice and soft. And I'm actually gonna cut it up into little cubes so that we can eat this with poutine. So this is, yes, you heard me right. It's gonna be a French fry um, dish topped with beef steak. Okay, so what I'm looking for is even color within the meat. So there's no raw red parts. It looks all kind of brownish. For me, that's good. And the smell right now is just wild. Really good. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and drop the rest of our ingredients into this. I have here just another boost of calamansi. I'm gonna cover this up with just chicken stock. I'm gonna sweeten it up with just a little bit of sugar. I'm gonna finish it off with some black pepper. Now to this, I'm gonna add a little bit more Yamamori extra soy sauce. About that much. Then again, just like the adobo, what we do is we bring this to a boil. Once it reaches boiling point, we turn it down to a simmer and we simmer it for about 30, 45 minutes. All right. Get my other stove on. And just like always, we're gonna taste it. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. Um, it's still under season, but I know that it's gonna concentrate in flavor, but the, the acid flavor is good. I like that citrusy note from the calamansi and the honey, or sorry, the uh, lemon. But if I need to add more, I might add a little bit more later. We'll see how it goes. Just waiting for it to come to a boil. Now, for this one, you can also add cream to the sauce a little bit later, so it has, looks like gravy when we put it on the french fries. And for the actual poutine itself, since we don't have time to make the cheese curds, I'll be using the uh, Arla mozzarella. All right, that smells awesome. I'll refill my salt. All right, sweet. So it's almost to a boil where I want it to be. I'll get the rest of my ingredients ready for what I need to make. All right, so it's come up to a boil. I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this to the other side so I can simmer this down. And we can go ahead and start on making the caramelized onions. Cause that's gonna take a while. All right. So we're gonna let that simmer down with the lid on it. Thank you, bro. I have my pan on. I'm gonna use a white onion for the caramelized onions. Now, there's two ways of doing this. Uh, you can use a mandolin or you can use a knife. Um, 
I personally like using a mandolin whenever I do this, but the problem is the entire kitchen gets kind of teary-eyed because you open up the uh, onion and it gets really, really potent in the air. So I'm just gonna use my knife. And normally, you know, I just realized I'm using my knife, so I don't need to keep it whole. Yeah, normally when we use mandolins, we keep the onion whole so that when we slice it, you get nice rings. And I just realized I'll be cutting it with a knife, not a mandolin. I didn't need to do that. Sorry. So when you do cut it, you want to kind of keep it as uniform in size as possible. Then when you kind of get to the end, you just flip the onion on itself. So you have a nice flat holding to hold on to when you get towards the end part. So again, we kind of cut the onion nice and thin by rocking your blade uh, back and forth or up and down. And when you feel that your thumb is on the board already, just turn the onion down on itself so you have a nice flat area to hold on to. And you just keep continuing your cutting process. So the more you do it, the faster this is gonna get, promise. Okay, so I have here um, some Arla cooking oil. I'm gonna add just a little bit to it. To this, I'm gonna add, um, I'm using Arla unsalted butter. About that much. And the reason why I add the oil is so that the butter doesn't burn quickly. So when the butter gets frothy and it's pretty much melted, I go ahead and add my onions. Now that's a lot of onions you're thinking, but yes, that is gonna melt down to pretty much nothing. We're gonna pinch a salt on that again. And it's all about controlling your heat. You wanna control it to make sure that it doesn't color too quickly. So I'm gonna turn my heat down to about a medium low. And I'm gonna slowly render the onion down. So it's gonna get soft slowly. It's not gonna burn. It's still gonna hold its shape. So as it evaporates, the onion sting goes in the air. So you're gonna kind of feel it. Some people are gonna choke, um, but it's, it's normal. Give it some time. When that starts to go away, then it starts to, the uh, sugar start to react and it starts to get darker and browner. But you wanna make sure that it doesn't darken the edge because what happens is you end up burning your onions instead of actually caramelizing them. Some people add a little bit of water in the beginning to kind of help that process down. Um, some people add beer. Um, some people add wine at the end. We're just gonna keep it as simple as possible and just, just butter, a little bit of oil, a little bit of salt and thyme. A whole lot of thyme. All right. So I'm gonna look at my beefsteak that's being happy. That looks good. I'm gonna ask Ian to come in and watch this for me while I cut my mushrooms.
Okay, so here we have um, cremini mushrooms. They're like really nice. They're actually really cheap right now, so I got them. And they actually will go good in your um, beef steak. So you can either pull off the stem or just cut them off. I prefer to cut them off. If they're not falling off, I just cut them off because there's still some edible meat in, in the stem that you can eat. And the only reason why I'm cutting them off is just because the bottom part oxidized a little bit and sometimes there's some dirt on it. Now, when you do get a mushroom, you wanna make sure that it's nice and dry. There's no slime on it. If it's slimy, then it's probably about to go bad. So just kind of look at them. And if they are kind of dirty, all you have to do is just get a clean towel. And just wipe them down like so. The worst thing to do is wet them. Do not wet them. Do not wash them under running water because what happens is the mushrooms will absorb up all that liquid and it becomes like a wet sponge. So it's, it's really not going to be a, a pleasurable or like a pleasurable eating experience. So just wipe them down. Don't ever, wa don't ever wash them. I mean, there's some mushrooms you can wash, but in general, don't wash them. Just give them a good wipe. I mean, if they're not really dirty, dirty, then just wipe them down. And as you can see that there was some dirt on the cap, that's normal. <clears throat> okay, so normally a lot of people would um, slice this up, but for me, since it's gonna be on poutine, I'm gonna kind of keep it chunky. So I'm gonna make it like a, like a dice or a quarter. So majority of the mushroom is water, right? It's, it's just a liquid. So when we do cut this, they are gonna kind of shrink on you. So if you see a little bit later when we actually saute this up, we're gonna add a little bit of gutter, uh, garlic and butter to this. Gutter, I, I combined the two words. Um, it's gonna kind of shrink up. And we want that to happen because what happens is it turns nice and brown. All right. Okay, so we have our mushrooms here. I'm gonna grab one clove of garlic. And then we're just gonna give this a really quick chop. Now, if you wanted to, you can pop this um, or grate it with a microplaner and it'll give you a really intense kind of garlic flavor. But the problem is you can't really saute it ahead of time because what happens is the garlic burns and it becomes bitter. So if that's the case, you add your butter, a little bit of salt and mushrooms in first, and then you throw in your garlic at the very end or the last 30 seconds. That way the garlic doesn't burn, but you have that really nice, strong garlic flavor. Okay, so I have my garlic ready for the pan. Watch your heat, bro. All right. All right, so as you can see, the onions are starting to gain a little bit of color, but not much. What we want to avoid is that look of where it's starting to get too brown because we know that the heat is too high. The onions aren't releasing the water fast enough. What's happening is you're, you're toasting them and actually, instead of actually caramelizing them. So just control the heat of your pan. If it gets too hot, lower the heat. If it's too low, increase the fire. Um, cooking is about how you do it, so don't be afraid to kind of change the parameters if you need to. 
After that, bro, I'm gonna drink some water. <clears throat> I remember when I was a newbie cook, we always had to do caramelized onions. I mean, if you were new to the kitchen, the job you would get was caramelized onions because they suck. They really, really, it really, really sucks doing them. So if you had caramelized onions, then the next thing that you would have to make is French onion soup. Now French onion soup was just another thing, another monster on its own because you have to make your, your, uh, your broth, your consomme, you have to make your bone broth. It's just uh, unreal. So the thing with caramelized onions is, once it starts to caramelize, it starts really, really quickly. It'll, it'll kind of take um, about two to three hours, I would say. Yeah, so if you were to make this in the hotel, we would get a really big braising pan and it would take us about, I would say 25 kilos of onions that you had to slice, or if you were lucky enough, they gave you a mandolin. So when you would cook it up, you would be stirring this big pot for about two to three hours. But once they start going like this one is, it'll be only a matter of time till that everything starts to caramelize correctly. Now remember, it's not gonna go um, really, really brown or golden. What happens is it turns kind of blonde like so, then it starts to get darker and darker and darker. The darker it gets, the sweeter the onions are. Some people, they add wine to it. Some people add a little bit of sugar or honey to kind of cheat, but just give it some time. It'll get there. You just need a whole lot of elbow grease. And the worst thing to do is add soy sauce to your onions because the flavor is just totally different. Uh, one time I had a cook do that to me. He, I had him make uh, caramelized onions and to cheat, he added soy sauce to it. Oh man, he was in trouble. Now my stove is just slightly acting up, so I have to play with my high heat and I have to move my pan off and on the fire just to control the cooking process. But normally it's not that hard. You can just kind of uh, uh, leave it on low heat and just stir it as you need it. But since he's not cooperating with me, I have to do a little bit more work. So you just have to keep watching it so it doesn't burn. I mean, you did all that hard work already. It would suck to burn it now. And it will burn on you if you're not careful. And believe it or not, it's actually easier to make a big batch of caramelized onions than it is a small one. So I'm almost there. This is like caramelized onions 101, man. Can you check my beef steak, bro? 
All right, so. I'm almost where I want it to be. I'm not gonna take it as far down as I can just because my stove isn't really playing nice. So I'm gonna keep it at a very light brown onion look to it. I'm gonna taste if that's sweet enough for me. Yeah, it's nice and sweet. It's slightly toastier than I like it to be, but it'll work. All right. Ian, but transfer so I know it's some plate but I need Okay, so that's good. I'm gonna go ahead and saute up my mushrooms. So we have everything ready before we build. Again, I'm, I'll be using the Arla unsalted butter. I'm gonna add just a little bit of oil so it doesn't burn. Now, this is kind of like the opposite of what we did earlier. We want the pan to get nice and hot, so when we add in the mushrooms, they kind of sear and they spit out their oil or their water. So if you put it into like a cold, cold medium heat pan, what happens is the mushrooms kind of uh, simmer away, you don't get that nice good sear, so the flavor profile won't be so pronounced. I mean, it'll get brown, but what happens is it shrinks up way too much. So we want the pan to get nice and hot. So when we add in our mushrooms, they have a nice kind of sizzle to them. And the best way to do it is, when the froth is gone, you're good. You can drop it. Right now it's kind of gone quiet. You don't hear that kind of sizzle anymore. You can go ahead and add in your mushrooms now. So we really want that popping kind of sound to it. We're gonna add a little bit of salt to it. And a little bit of cracked black pepper. And once it hits the pan, leave it there. Don't touch it, let it do its thing. Let it kind of get happy. We want the uh, kind of flavors to develop in the mushroom. And again, my garlic is still on the board. I'm not gonna add it in because I, if I add it in now, what's gonna happen is it's gonna burn and it's not gonna be good to eat. So if you can see from um, JR's cam, we do have a lot of oil and butter in it earlier, but now it kind of disappeared because the mushrooms actually absorbed it up. And when it gets louder, I'm gonna toss it. So what we're looking for is that kind of nice browning of the mushroom. Like that one right there. That's ideal, because that's really just flavor. Now, from that kind of dry look to it, as you can see, it's starting to get moist now. That's because the mushrooms are kind of extracting their liquid, their water. That's what we want. We want that nice kind of brown color because we know that's flavor. And just kind of keep an eye on it. I mean, if you wanted to make a pasta sauce with this, you could. 
Get this mushroom in, add some cream to it, a little bit of chicken stock, some parsley. That would be pretty bomb. Do we have local mushrooms here? Like a, a mushroom that's native to the Philippines? A kabute, right? Do we have any native kabutes here? I don't know. Okay, so that's pretty much where I want it to be when I add in my garlic. So from that kind of really basic mushroomy smell, we add a bit of butter and some fresh garlic and it just comes alive. Oh, now that smells good, right? It's beautiful, it's nice and shiny. Now what I'm doing is, I'm just ensuring that the garlic is cooked. So I'm gonna toss it, um, continuously toss it until I can smell and see that the garlic is actually cooked. If I don't, and if my guest or my client or my friend eats this and he gets a lot of raw garlic, then it's not gonna be happiness in his mouth. It's gonna be kind of um, hot and kind of pungent garlic flavor, which is not good. So just take some time. Perfect. Okay, if you wanted to, you can add some fresh herbs to this, but um, this is gonna be a topping, not a side, so I'm happy where it's at. And we're gonna go ahead and leave that right there. And if you know me, I love mushrooms, so I can't resist to taste one. But again, this is hot, so I'm actually gonna pop it in my mouth because I'm gonna burn myself. Hot. That's really good. That's really good. I'm a mushroom guy. All right. So I think this should be about done. Now the best way to go is to taste it. Uh -huh. I can't emphasize as much as you have to taste everything. That's good. All right. So let me just give this a whack. Mm. Oh, I know. Let me get it, I know. Cooked meat board. Okay, so my beefsteak is done. It's nice and soft. Has a really good flavor. So what I'm gonna do now is strain everything out and then I'm gonna thicken the sauce or add a little bit of cream to this. Now while I'm thickening everything up, Ian is gonna go ahead and fry me some french fries because you can't have poutine without french fries. And for me, I'll be using the Avico super crunchy uh, french fry because I think it's really, really nice. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna pop on a board. This is a nice clean board. I don't cut anything cooked or anything raw on my wooden board. If I find anyone doing that, it's war. Or Ian, can you strain this out for me, buddy? I need a, oh no, it's okay, it's okay.
Okay. So I have my sauce here. Come on, work with me. You're my friend. I'm gonna bring that to a boil. I'm gonna let this cool down slightly because I know it's pretty hot. Or I'll just cut what I need for my actual dish so it's not so painful. So we're just cutting them up into kind of poutine size cuts. About that, I'll wash my hands real quick. <clears throat> okay, so to this, I'm gonna add some Arla Whip and Cook. Sing a flat with snap then, brother. I'll bring this back to a boil. Give it a good stir. We have a slurry, bro. All right. Now, if you can see, the cream does kind of look a little bit split, and that's normal. It's because there's acid within this that's kind of strong, so that acid here profile would be stronger than it would be in, in the uh, adobo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a starch to help bind everything up. <clears throat> I just need it to come to a boil real quick. And right here is just a corn starch and water slurry. Just a little. Oh. And I think I'm happy with that. Perfect. I'll give that a quick taste. That's good. All right. So my poutine gravy is ready. My mushroom garnish is ready. My lovely beef is ready. And my french fries are working. And I have my poutine or my mozzarella cheese there. That's gonna be nice and melty in place of the cheese curds. So what I'm gonna do now is I am gonna get my plating ready for this and we're gonna to start to build everything up. Uh-huh, just plain and bold, bro. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, brother. That was scooting me on board, buddy. Wash that. Thank you, bro. You got your cuchillo, huh? All right. How long, Ian? Three minutes. Three minutes for French fries? Yeah. Where's my stop? Oh, here it is. Okay, so I'm going to be using this as my vessel. Um, you can use pretty much whatever you like. Um, you can put them in a basket if you want. No, don't put it in a basket because it's gravy. So put it in a bowl or some type of container 
Uh, but I'm using this because it looks rustic. It looks kind of like westernish looking thing. And um, I love my stob. It's really a good serving dish. And you can cook in it too. All right, so my mushrooms are done. My lovely gravy is nice and thick. My french fries are taking a very long time because Ian is not frying them enough. My caramelized onions are pretty much good. And my Arla mozzarella cheese is ready. So all we have to do now is wait for Ian to get done. And the thing I love about making a poutine, it's like something that you can make if you guys want to watch like a, a Netflix series at home. I know a lot of you guys are like watching that Korean stuff, but I personally don't. But um, I think it's landing on home, but yeah, or uh, landing, what is it? The landing thingy? Crash landing on you. So yeah, if you got, I think that's kind of old now. Um, but yeah, you can watch that. And then so you can make this ahead of time, fry up your French fries, um, build everything up, and then you guys can sit down on the couch and have a poutine kind of like Netflix series watching thing uh, for like Korean novellas. Or if you're like me, I like the um, action kind of movies. I am an anime junkie, so I'm glad that anime is now on Netflix. So yeah, please try this. Um, and this goes very, very good um, with a nice cold drink. You can definitely have this um, with anything. Uh, Ian calls this bar chow, but it's something that I would normally eat um, when I would go to Canada. Um, I would grab some poutine uh, and I like it with like kind of au jus with mine. So that's why I kind of thought of this because it has, I have the mushrooms on it. I have kind of like that tart kind of uh, sauce instead of it being au jus, it's going to be like a thick kind of creamy gravy. Um, and then we're going to top it with some nice sweet caramelized onions and of course our lovely beef. You can always substitute the beef if you want to with pork or chicken, but don't call it beef steak. So normally what we do is we salt our fries, right when they come out of the fryer. The salt sticks to the fries a whole lot better that way. All right, so my fries are now inside. Uh, I'm gonna start building everything up. And what I like to do is I like to add in my mozzarella first. And the reason for it is my fries are nice and hot. And what happens is it kind of melts into the French fries. So, Normally this would be cheese curds. Um, cheese curds have a very low melting point, but since we don't have cheese curds um, and it's really, I don't have enough time to make them, we are using mozzarella cheese. And it does have a low melting point as well, so that's okay. All right. I have here my lovely gravy. I'm gonna to top my fries with this lovely gravy. Now, the reason why I put the gravy on first is because if I put everything else on first, the gravy's gonna hide it. So we wanna kinda of showcase it and say, hey, we have um, beef on this. I'm gonna go ahead and add my lovely beef steak. That just looks awesome. All right. Okay. I have here my lovely, beautifully sauteed mushrooms. I, my, uh, my mouth is watering already, yeah. I literally mouth watering right now, man. I, I can't wait to tuck in. Now the beautiful thing about poutine is you wanna kind of load it up. You want it to have a whole lot of happiness inside. And then we have here this kind of nice, sweet onions that goes on top. 
So you get that little hint of sweetness from the onions. That's super kind of soury, salty beefsteak and the melted creaminess of cheese. And we're gonna just add a little bit of more mozzarella on top, just so that they know it's there. Now, if you wanted to, you can take a torch to this and melt down that mozzarella, but we're not going to. Or if you were in a hotel or a restaurant, you can pop this under a salamander and it would be ready. But for me, that's just one awesome big dish of poutine. Filipino style, baby. All right. All right, so we have two dishes down. We got one more to go. And this is gonna be a fan favorite, which is tapsilog, okay? Um, this tapsilog, you can kind of make this for um, a breakfast. For example, if you had um, a really great night for Valentine's Day, your girlfriend or your family's spent the night over at your house, you can always make this for their kind of like their breakfast get up and say, hey, it was a wonderful night. Um, have some beautiful tapsilog. Now, if you want to, you can also sell this. Um, this actually is a really good setup. It's a very quick recipe where the marination of the tapa is there. And all you have to do is uh, quickly marinate it and then you're done. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a board and I'm gonna get my meat. <clears throat> now today what I'm using is um, breakfast cut, is what they call it. And um, it's sirloin of beef. We're gonna go ahead and slice it up nice and thin. Thank you, Ian. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna call in Jasper. Jasper, please come here. Jasper is gonna be prepping my garlic for the garlic fried rice. Now, you wanna make sure when you do get your beef, you can always ask your butchers to cut them for you like this. And all it is is thinly cut. You can go a little bit thinner if you want, which is the sukiyaki cut. But for me, this is, um, this is good enough. Because sukiyaki cut can cost a little bit more. All right. So what Jasper is doing behind me is he's just cutting up my garlic so it's nice and chunky. And the reason for it is there's this place that we used to go to eat tapa. If you're familiar with uh, the area in Pasig, which is called Kalawaan, there was a place called Top Secret, and I used to love eating their tapa there. And this is what inspired me to make this dish. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna cut the tapa up into about two inch cuts from where it was. Now, there was this one cook her name is Basha. She cooked the best tapa. Okay, so we're cutting it up into cuts like about that big. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and set that to the side. I'm gonna wash my hands. So I'm gonna get my marination ready. Nice and fine, brother, huh? Okay. So I'm gonna move this to the back, just so that it's away. I'm gonna wash my knife. And I'm gonna get some garlic down into this beautiful marination bowl. Now since Jasper already has garlic, I'm gonna grab some of his garlic and I'm gonna give him more to cut. That's a good thing about having a kami in the kitchen. Now to this, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of oyster sauce. And this is gonna give it that kind of caramel flavor profile, um, kind of like an umami boost. And for this, I'll be using Yamamori Choice soy sauce. The reason for it is I have the sweetness already from the oyster sauce. What I want is that high um, saltiness that give, or that you get from the Yamamori choice. Okay. I'm gonna also add in some brown sugar to this. Ah. 
I like using calamansi juice. You can use um, vinegar if you wanted to, but I find that the sourness is not as predominant in calamansi juice. So any citrus juice would work. And what I'm doing is I'm just stirring it down until I don't feel the crystals or the grains of sugar. I'm now adding some black pepper. So as you can tell through this episode, we have a lot of similar ingredients in our dishes. So I'm just trying to prove a point that just because you have limited amount of stocks, it doesn't mean that you can't create things that are totally different. And that's the beauty of cooking. It's just like creating things with what you have and it's just so fun. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and marinate this. Okay. And you really wanna get your hands in there. And what you're doing is you're kind of separating the pieces of meat while you're pushing it into the marination. And what that makes a really good um, distribution of flavor. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and run this through like a, if you got like big pieces of meat, you can tenderize it and all that. That'll work as well. But try to get the thin cuts of meat. It actually ends up a whole lot better. And at this time, I'm also feeling if there's any sugar crystals that are big, but right now there's none. So if you do feel that there's a little bit of sugar crystals inside, just work it until it's gone. Because what happens is the sugar content in the recipe is gonna vary. You won't get an e easy distribution of flavor. Okay, so I'm gonna hand this off to Ian now. I'm gonna wash my hands and he's gonna get me one that I already marinated. <clears throat> All right, so what Jasper is doing is he's chopping up the garlic to make sure it's nice and fine. What I'm gonna do now is I am gonna go ahead and cook down my meat. Thanks, Ian. So as you can see, my beautiful tapa has been marinating for, I would say about three hours, cause that's about how long we marinated the uh, tapa and the beefsteak. So this is actually ready to go um, sauteed in the pan. Uh, and then all you have to do is just crack open the bag, add it to the pan, you add just a little bit of butter, or a little bit of oil, it's totally up to you. And then we're gonna saute it down until it's cooked. Now, since it's thin cuts of meat, this cooks extremely fast. So if you wanted to, you can make your tapa, marinate it. You don't have to vacuum seal it. You can put it into like some bowl, just make sure you cover it with a cover, leave it in your refrigerator. So the next morning um, when your friends, parents, girlfriend, wife is up, you just have to take it out and saute it up. So just like, how you would get store-bought tapa. But this one is way better, trust me, because we know what we're putting inside. There's no chemicals. There's none of that bad stuff inside. It's just 100% pure meat and pure enough. So now Jasper is done with this. He's gonna go ahead and start sauteing up and making the garlic, butter garlic rice. Now, the reason why I'm having Jasper do it is because he is a newbie and I have to train him. And this is actually his, one of his recipes, actually. He makes it really good. So when we make staff meal, um, and I feel like eating a really good flavorful rice, I would say Jasper, butter garlic rice. Okay. So I'm just gonna use that much because this is a bit too much tapa. I'll give this back to Ian. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add just a little bit of water to this, just to kind of help it through. And I know when that water evaporates, this is ready. So, or I'll use a little bit of stock since I have stock.
Now, since this is fully seasoned and fully marinated, you don't need to season this anymore. Now, with the flavor of the Yamamori that it gives, it gives that nice kind of salty sharpness to it. So this tapa is gonna be unreal, I'm telling you. Okay, so my tapa is getting nice and good. We're getting that butter and the uh, garlic right. And why he's stirring it constantly is because if he burns this, he's in trouble. So we have butter in, garlic in. We have refrigerated rice or day old rice. And he's gonna add that in and just stir it around. So he's actually getting the rice ready now. My tapa is almost done. So I'm gonna get my egg ready for the actual silog part of it. All right. So kind of trivia, I do make some videos that I do post and um, sometimes there's an arm that's tattooed kind of stirring up my pot and people always ask me, did you get a tattoo? Nope, it's Jasper. I just never showed his face. But Jasper is the one who normally stirs up things for me and that's why there's a tattooed arm. So if you guys actually ask the question, now you know. Tattooed arm man, not me. All right, so what I'm waiting for is the liquid to get fully evaporated from the pan. When that happens, I know that the top is perfectly cooked and it's ready to eat. So my timing should exactly be right. By the time this gets done, the butter garlic rice is done because it's gonna be fantastic. Then I have my pan here. Now, another tip of the, uh, or pro tip is, when you do make uh, a sunny side up egg or a fried egg, you have to make sure that you crack the egg in a separate container. That way if the egg breaks, if there's any shell, you can pick it out of the bowl and not the pan. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm getting my pan oil hot because I'm gonna fry the egg not um, like do a sunny side up or over easy. It's gonna be fried, fried egg. So crispy along the outsides and not kind of nice and wet inside. And again, when you're gonna crack an egg, flat surface is always the best. Crack it on a flat surface, open it up, straight into a little bowl. That way it doesn't catch on any of the jagged edges. And then it stays nice and whole. Now, again, if there was a piece of shell in there, I can look at it and see if there's a piece of shell. There's none, so I'm good. Now the sound is changing. I know that this is starting to get dry, so I have to keep an eye on it. So my timing is right. Jasper is almost done with his. My top is almost done. My oil is nice and hot. How much longer, buddy? Two minutes. Two minutes, Two minutes. perfect. So I want the oil to almost be smoking. Then we just pour it in very, very slowly. And we let it do its thing. So like I said before, timing is everything. I lost one. Did you taste that, brother? How's it taste? Tastes nice? Are you sure?
I like it just like that. Um, if you want to make this kind of saucy, you add a little bit of water to it. And I'm good with my egg starting to get fried. Now the problem with this egg, I added it when the oil wasn't hot enough. So I'm not kind of happy with that. Although there's nothing wrong with the egg itself, I'm gonna do another one. Because that's not what I'm looking for. I kind of want it more crispy instead of it being kind of like that. Whoa, so we start again. That egg looks funky, you know? Give me a new egg, bro. It's like it's starting to form a chick. All right. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now is uh, I'm gonna get my oil nice and hot and start again. Now, like I said earlier, if you wanted this gr to be more gravy-like, you can always add just water to it, and what's gonna happen is the sauce is gonna kinda come out and it's gonna be a bit more soupy. But for me, I'm, I like it like this. I'm waiting for my oil to smoke a little bit, just so that it can kinda come up, and what I'm gonna do is change fire. Okay. It's hard to see the smoke with the lights there. All right, so I'm pretty much where I want it to be. Right there, I can smell it. And that's what I wanna hear. Right when I put it in, it should be like that, but wow, this egg is just crazy. egg is not so fresh. So I want the crispy edges on the outside so that that kind of outside area is like a crispy, crunchy kind of thing. I like that, especially in my Topsy Log. And the way Basha would cook this is in a wok with a whole lot of oil. I wonder where Basha is now, no? Okay, I'm good with that. I'm actually gonna leave it right there. I'm gonna set this aside. And then what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna plate everything up. rice spoon, Jess. All right, so this is gonna be an extremely simple Topsy Log recipe. We have some uh, garlic fried rice enhanced with Arla butter. Uh, we're using unsalted butter as always because we like to control the amount of salt that we get or we put into our food. And again, just like everything else, we're keeping it extremely rustic. So I call this Jasper's garlic fried rice. We have here top secret stapa. We have our lovely fried egg. And then I'm gonna add some achara to this because I love achara with my, my uh, tapa. Can I have a small container, brother? Mm. 
Now I'm telling you, this is extremely comfort foodish in flavor. Thank you, Ian. We have here some homemade achara. We actually made this for a client. And um, since I do love raisins, we have California raisins from Global Pacific. We did add it to our chara for a little burst of sweetness. But uh, this will take a while to make, so maybe in the next episode, I'll show you how to make a chara. Now, if you wanted to, you can always add um, vinegar to this as well. But here you have it, a classic um, kind of like, what do you call that? A carandiria? Carandiria? Carandiria Topsy Love. All right, hope you guys like it. Check that out. And that's all for today's episode of A Taste of Home Season 2 Filipino Favorites. Don't forget to follow Global Pacific's Facebook page for more updates, recipes, and live demos. To buy our products, our world-class products, you can go to the stores in Luzon, Aldi Supermarket, Best Value, Factory Outlet Corp, Johnny Supermarket, Angeles Supermarket, Inc., My Mima's House of Ingredients Trading, in the Visayas, New Yan Yan's Commercial, Gaisano Supermarket, and in Mindanao, NCC Supermarket, Rafsky Cakes and Bakery Supply, Gaisano Supermarket, and Theus Supermarket in Dapitan City. So guys, I hope you guys love this episode of A Taste of Home Season 2. So um, stay tuned because we're going to have a whole lot more. A lot of chefs are going to be giving you some recipes that you can create at home. So until the next time, it's nice seeing you. Keep on cooking.